What is to be done? By V.I. Lennon. Chapter 1. Dogmatism and Freedom of Criticism. A. What does freedom of criticism mean? Freedom of criticism is undoubtedly the most fashionable slogan at the present time and the one most frequently employed in the controversies between socialists and democrats in all countries. At first sight, nothing would appear to be more strange than the solemn appeals to freedom of criticism made by one of the parties to the dispute. Have voices been raised in the advanced parties against the constitutional law of the majority of European countries which guarantees freedom to science and scientific investigation? Something must be wrong here, will be the comment of the onlooker who has heard this fashionable slogan repeated at every turn but has not yet penetrated the essence of the disagreement among the disputants. Evidently, this slogan is one of the conventional phrases which, like nicknames, become legitimized by use and become almost generic terms. In fact, it is no secret for anyone that two trends have taken form in present-day international social democracy. The conflict between these trends now flares up in a bright flame and now dies down and smolders under the ashes of imposing truce resolutions. The essence of the new trend, which adopts a critical attitude towards obsolete dogmatic Marxism, has been clearly enough presented by Bernstein and demonstrated by Millerand. Social democracy must change from a party of social revolution into a democratic party of social reforms. Bernstein has surrounded this political demand with a whole battery of well-attuned new arguments and reasonings. Denied was the possibility of putting socialism on a scientific basis and of demonstrating its necessity and inevitability from the point of view of the materialist conception of history. Denied was the fact of growing impoverishment, the process of proletarization, and the intensification of capitalist contradictions. The very concept, ultimate aim, was declared to be unsound, and the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat was completely rejected. Denied was the antithesis, in principle, between liberalism and socialism. Denied was the theory of the class struggle, on the alleged grounds that it could not be applied to a strictly democratic society, governed according to the will of the majority, etc. Thus, the demand for a decisive turn from revolutionary social democracy to bourgeois social reformism was accompanied by a no less decisive turn towards bourgeois criticism of all the fundamental ideas of Marxism. In view of the fact that this criticism of Marxism has long been directed from the political platform, from university chairs, in numerous pamphlets, and in a series of learned treatises, in view of the fact that the entire younger generation of the educated classes has been systematically reared for decades on this criticism, it is not surprising that the new critical trend in social democracy should spring up all complete like Minerva from the head of Jove. The content of this new trend did not have to grow and take shape. It was transferred bodily from bourgeois to socialist literature. To proceed, if Bernstein's theoretical criticism and political yearnings were still unclear to anyone, the French took the trouble strikingly to demonstrate the new method. In this instance, too, France has justified its old reputation of being the land where, more than anywhere else, the historical class struggles were each time fought out to a decision. The French socialists have begun not to theorize, but to act. The democratically more highly developed political conditions in France have permitted them to put Bernsteinism into practice, immediately, with all its consequences. Millerand has furnished an excellent example of practical Bernsteinism. Not without reason did Bernstein and Volmar rush so zealously to defend and laud him. Indeed, if social democracy, in essence, is merely a party of reform and must be bold enough to admit this openly, then not only 
has a socialist the right to join a bourgeois cabinet, but he must always strive to do so. If democracy, in essence, means the abolition of class domination, then why should not a socialist minister charm the whole bourgeois world by orations on class collaboration? Why should he not remain in the cabinet even after the shooting down of workers by gendarmes has exposed, for the hundredth and thousandth time, the real nature of the democratic collaboration of classes? Why should he not personally take part in greeting the Tsar, for whom the French socialists now have no other name than Hero of the Gallows, Nout and Exile? And the reward for this utter humiliation and self-degradation of socialism in the face of the whole world, for the corruption of the socialist consciousness of the working masses, the only basis that can guarantee our victory. The reward for this is pompous projects for miserable reforms, so miserable, in fact, that much more has been obtained from bourgeois governments. He who does not deliberately close his eyes cannot fail to see that the new critical trend in socialism is nothing more or less than a new variety of opportunism. And if we judge people not by the glittering uniforms they don or by the high-sounding appellations they give themselves, but by their actions and by what they actually advocate, it will be clear that freedom of criticism means freedom for an opportunist trend in social democracy, freedom to convert social democracy into a democratic party of reform, freedom to introduce bourgeois ideas and bourgeois elements into socialism. Freedom is a grand word, but under the banner of freedom for industry, the most predatory wars were waged. Under the banner of freedom of labor, the working people were robbed. The modern use of the term freedom of criticism contains the same inherent falsehood. Those who are really convinced that they have made progress in science would not demand freedom from the new views to continue side by side with the old, but the substitution of the new views for the old. The cry heard today, long live freedom of criticism, is too strongly reminiscent of the fable of the empty barrel. We are marching in a compact group, along a precipitous and difficult path, firmly holding each other by the hand. We are surrounded on all sides by enemies, and we have to advance almost constantly under their fire. We have combined by a freely adopted decision for the purpose of fighting the enemy, and not of retreating into the neighboring marsh, the inhabitants of which, from the very outset, have reproached us with having separated ourselves into an exclusive group, and with having chosen the path of struggle instead of the path of conciliation. And now some among us begin to cry out, Let us go into the marsh. And when we begin to shame them, they retort, What backward people you are! Are you not ashamed to deny us the liberty to invite you to take a better road? Oh yes, gentlemen, you are free not only to invite us, but to go yourselves wherever you will, even into the marsh. In fact, we think that the marsh is your proper place, and we are prepared to render you every assistance to get there. Only let go of our hands, don't clutch at us, and don't besmirch the grand word freedom. For we too are free to go where we please. Free to fight not only against the marsh, but also against those who are turning towards the marsh. B. The New Advocates of Freedom of Criticism Now this slogan has in recent times been solemnly advanced by Rabochai Dilo organ of the Union of Russian Social Democrats Abroad, not as a theoretical postulate, but as a political demand, as a reply to the question, is it possible to unite the social democratic organizations operating abroad? For a durable unity, there must be freedom of criticism. From this statement, two definite conclusions follow. One, that Rabochai Dilo has taken under its wing the opportunist trend in international social democracy in general, and two, that Rabochai Dilo demands freedom for opportunism in Russian social democracy. 
Let us examine these conclusions. Rabochai Dilo is particularly displeased with the inclination of Iskra and Zarya to predict a rupture between the mountain and the Gerand in international social democracy. Generally speaking, writes B. Krzyzewski, editor of Rabochai Dilo, this talk of the mountain and the Gerand heard in the ranks of social democracy represents a shallow historical analogy a strange thing to come from the pen of a Marxist. The mountain and the Durand did not represent different temperaments or intellectual trends, as the historians of social thought may think, but different classes or strata, the middle bourgeoisie on the one hand and the petty bourgeoisie and the proletariat on the other. In the modern socialist movement, however, there is no conflict of class interests the socialist movement in its entirety, in all of its diverse forms, including the most pronounced Burstinians, stands on the basis of the class interests of the proletariat and its class struggle for political and economic emancipation. A bold assertion. Has not Krzyzewski heard of the fact, long ago noted, that it is precisely the extensive participation of an academic stratum in the socialist movement in recent years that has promoted such a rapid spread of Bernsteinism? And what is most important, on what does our author found this opinion that even the most pronounced Bernsteinians stand on the basis of the class struggle for the political and economic emancipation of the proletariat? No one knows. This determined defense of the most pronounced Bernsteinians is not supported by any argument or reasoning whatever. Apparently, the author believes that if he repeats what the most pronounced Burstinians say about themselves, his assertion requires no proof. But can anything more shallow be imagined than this judgment of an entire trend, based on nothing more than what the representatives of that trend say about themselves? Can anything more shallow be imagined than the subsequent homily on the two different and even diametrically opposite types or paths of party development. The German Social Democrats, in other words, recognize complete freedom of criticism, but the French do not, and it is precisely their example that demonstrates the bane of intolerance. To this we can only say that the very example B. Krzyzewski affords us attests to the fact that the name Marxists is at times assumed by people who conceive history literally in the Idolovsky manner. To explain the unity of the German Socialist Party and the disunity of the French Socialist Party, there is no need whatever to go into the special features in the history of these countries to contrast the conditions of military semi-absolutism in the one with republican parliamentarism in the other. To analyze the effects of the Paris Commune and the effects of the exceptional law against the socialists, to compare the economic life and economic development of the two countries, or to recall that the unexampled growth of German social democracy was accompanied by a strenuous struggle, unique in the history of socialism, not only against erroneous theories, but also against erroneous tactics, etc., etc. All that is superfluous. The French quarrel among themselves because they are intolerant. The Germans are united because they are good boys. And observe, this piece of matchless profundity is designed to refute the fact that puts to rout the defense of the Bernsteinians. The question whether or not the Bernsteinians stand on the basis of the class struggle of the proletariat is one that can be completely and irrevocably answered only by historical experience. Consequently, the example of France holds greatest significance in this respect because France is the only country in which the Bernsteinians attempted to stand independently on their own feet with the warm approval of their German colleagues. The reference to the intolerance of the French, apart from its historical significance, turns out to be merely an attempt to hush up very unpleasant facts with angry invectives. Nor are we inclined to make a present of the Germans to Krzyzewski 
and the numerous other champions of freedom of criticism. If the most pronounced Bernsteinians are still tolerated in the ranks of the German party, it is only to the extent that they submit to the Hanover Resolution, which emphatically rejected Bernstein's amendments, and to the Lübeck Resolution, which contains a direct warning to Bernstein. It is debatable, from the standpoint of the interest of the German party, whether diplomacy was appropriate, and whether, in this case, a bad peace is better than a good quarrel. In short, opinions may differ as to the expediency of any one of the methods employed to reject Bernsteinism. But that the German party did reject Bernsteinism on two occasions is the fact no one can fail to see. Therefore, to think that the German example confirmed the thesis that the most pronounced Bernsteinians stand on the basis of the class struggle of the proletariat for political and economic emancipation means to fail completely to understand what is going on under our very eyes. Nor is that all. As we have seen, Rabochai Dilo demands freedom of criticism and defends Bernsteinism before Russian social democracy. Apparently, it convinced itself that we were unfair to our critics and Bernsteinians. But to which ones? Who? Where? When? What did the unfairness represent? About this, not a word. Rabochai Dilo does not name a single Russian critic or Bernsteinian. We are left with but one or two possible suppositions. Either the unfairly treated party is none other than Rabochai Dilo itself. If that is the case, how is the strange fact to be explained that Rabochai Dilo, which always vehemently dissociated itself from all solidarity with Bernsteinism, could not defend itself without putting in a word in defense of the most pronounced Bernsteinians and of freedom of criticism, or some third persons have been treated unfairly. If this is the case, then what reasons may there be for not naming them? We see, therefore, that Rabochai Dilo is continuing to play the game of hide-and-seek it has played ever since its founding. And let us note further this first practical application of the vaunted freedom of criticism. In actual fact, not only was it forthwith reduced to abstention from all criticism, but also to abstention from expressing independent views altogether. The very Rabochai Dilo, which avoids mentioning Russian Bernsteinism as if it were a shameful disease, proposes for the treatment of this disease to copy word for word the latest German prescription for the German variety of the malady. Instead of freedom of criticism, slavish imitation, the very same social and political content of modern international opportunism reveals itself in a variety of ways according to national peculiarities. In one country, the opportunists have long ago come out under a separate flag. In another, they have ignored theory and in fact pursued the policy of the radicals socialists. In a third, some members of the Revolutionary Party have deserted to the camp of opportunism and strive to achieve their aims, not in open struggle for principles and for new tactics, but by gradual, imperceptible, and, if one may so put it, unpunishable corruption of their party. In a fourth country, similar deserters employ the same methods in the gloom of political slavery and with a completely original combination of legal and illegal activity, etc. To talk of freedom of criticism and of Bernsteinism as a condition for uniting the Russian Social Democrats and not to explain how Russian Bernsteinism has manifested itself and what particular fruits it has borne amounts to talking with the same of saying nothing. Let us ourselves try, if only in a few words, to say what Rabochai Dilo did not want to say. C. Criticism in Russia The chief distinguishing feature of Russia in regard to the point we are examining is that the very beginning of the spontaneous working class movement, on the one hand, and of the turn of progressive public opinion towards Marxism, on the other, was marked by the combination of manifestly heterogeneous 
elements under a common flag to fight the common enemy. We refer to the heyday of legal Marxism. Speaking generally, this was an altogether curious phenomenon that no one in the 80s or the beginning of the 90s would have believed possible. In a country ruled by an autocracy with a completely enslaved press, in a period of desperate political reaction in which even the tiniest outgrowth of political discontent and protest is persecuted, the theory of revolutionary Marxism suddenly forces its way into the censored literature and, though expounded in Ezopian language, is understood by all the interested. The government had accustomed itself to regarding only the theory of the Narodnaya Volya as dangerous, without, as is usual, observing its internal evolution and rejoicing at any criticism leveled against it. Quite a considerable time elapsed before the government realized what had happened, and the unwieldy army of censors and gendarmes discovered the new enemy, and flung itself upon him. Meanwhile, Marxist books were published one after another. Marxist journals and newspapers were founded. Nearly everyone became a Marxist. Marxists were flattered. Marxists were courted. And the book publishers rejoiced at the extraordinary, ready sale of Marxist literature. It was quite natural, therefore, that among the Marxian neophytes who were caught up in this atmosphere, there should be more than one author who got a swelled head. We can now speak calmly of this period as an event of the past. It is no secret that the brief period in which Marxism blossomed on the surface of our literature was called forth by an alliance between people of extreme and of very moderate views. In point of fact, the latter were bourgeois Democrats. This conclusion suggested itself to some even when the alliance was still intact. That being the case, are not the revolutionary social democrats who entered into the alliance with the future critics, mainly responsible for the subsequent confusion? This question, together with a reply in the affirmative, is sometimes heard from people with too rigid a view. But such people are entirely in the wrong. Only those who are not sure of themselves can fear to enter into temporary alliances, even with unreliable people. Not a single political party could exist without such alliances. The combination with the legal Marxists was, in its way, the first really political alliance entered into by Russian Social Democrats. Thanks to this alliance, an astonishingly rapid victory was obtained over Neurotism and Marxist ideas became very widespread. Moreover, the alliance was not concluded altogether without conditions. Evidence of this is the burning of the censor in 1895 of the Marxist collection Material on the Question of the Economic Development of Russia. If the literary agreement with the legal Marxist can be compared with a political alliance, then that book can be compared with a political treaty. The rupture, of course, did not occur because the Allies proved to be bourgeois Democrats. On the contrary, the representatives of the latter trend are natural and desirable allies of social democracy, insofar as its democratic tasks, brought to the fore by the prevailing situation in Russia, are concerned. But an essential condition for such an alliance must be the full opportunity for the socialists to reveal to the working class that its interests are diametrically opposed to the interests of the bourgeoisie. However, the Bernsteinian and critical trend to which the majority of the legal Marxists turned deprived the socialists of this opportunity and demoralized the socialist consciousness by vulgarizing Marxism, by advocating the theory of the blunting of social contradictions, by declaring the idea of the social revolution and of the dictatorship of the proletariat to be absurd, by reducing the working class movement and the class struggle to narrow trade unionism and to a realistic struggle for petty, gradual reforms. This was synonymous with bourgeois democracy's denial of socialism's right to independence and, consequently, of its right to existence. In practice, it meant a striving to convert the nascent working-class movement into an appendage of the liberals. 
Naturally, under such circumstances, the rupture was necessary. But the peculiar feature of Russia manifested itself in the fact that this rupture simply meant the elimination of the Social Democrats from the most accessible and widespread legal literature. The ex-Marxists who took up the flag of criticism and who obtained almost a monopoly to demolish Marxism entrenched themselves in this literature. Catchwords like against orthodoxy and long live freedom of criticism forthwith became the vogue, and the fact that neither the censor nor the gendarmes could resist this vogue is apparent from the publication of three Russian editions of the work of the celebrated Bernstein, and from the fact that the works of Bernstein, Mr. Prokopovich, and others were recommended by Zubatov. A task now devolved upon the Social Democrats that was difficult in itself and was made incredibly more difficult by purely external obstacles. The task of combating the new trend. This trend did not confine itself to the sphere of literature. The turn towards criticism was accompanied by an infatuation for economism among social democratic practical workers. The manner in which the connection between an interdependence of legal criticism and illegal economism arose and grew is in itself an interesting subject, one that could serve as the theme of a special article. We need only note here that this connection undoubtedly existed. The notoriety deserved acquired by the credo was due precisely to the frankness with which it formulated this connection and blurted out the fundamental political tendency of economism. Let the workers carry on the economic struggle, and let the Marxist intelligentsia merge with the liberals for the political struggle. Thus, trade unionist work among the people meant fulfilling the first part of this task, while legal criticism meant fulfilling the second. This statement was such an excellent weapon against economism that, had there been no credo, it would have been worth inventing one. The credo was not invented, but it was published without the consent, and perhaps even against the will of its authors. At all events, the present writer, who took part in dragging this new program into the light of day, has heard complaints and reproaches to the effect that copies of the resume of the speaker's views were distributed, dubbed the credo, and even published in the press together with the protests. We refer to this episode because it reveals a very peculiar feature of our economism, fear of publicity. This is a feature of economism generally, and not of the authors of the credo alone. It was revealed by that most outspoken and honest advocate of economism, Rabochaya Meisel, and by Rabochai Dilo, as well as by the Kiev Committee which two years ago refused to permit the publication of its profession de foi, together with a repudiation of it, and by many other individual representatives of the economism. This fear of criticism displayed by the advocates of freedom of criticism cannot be attributed solely to craftiness. No, the majority of the economists look with sincere resentment upon all theoretical controversies, factional disagreements, broad political questions, plans for organizing revolutionaries, etc. Leave all that to the people abroad, said a fairly consistent economist to me one day, thereby expressing a very widespread view. Our concern is the working class movement, the workers, organizations here, in our localities. All the rest is merely the invention of doctrinaires, the overrating of ideology. As the authors of the letter, published in Iskra, Number 12, expressed it, in unison with Rabochai Dilo, number 10. The question now arises, such being a peculiar features of Russian criticism and Russian Bernsteinism, what should have been the task of those who sought to oppose opportunism in deeds and not merely in words? First, they should have made efforts to resume the theoretical work that had barely begun in the period of legal Marxism and that fell anew on the shoulders of the comrades working underground. Without such work, the successful growth of the movement was impossible. 
Secondly, they should have actively combated the legal criticism that was perverting people's minds on a considerable scale. Thirdly, they should have actively opposed confusion and vacillation in the practical movement, exposing and repudiating every conscious or unconscious attempt to degrade our program and our tactics. That Rapochai Dilo did none of these things is well known. We shall have occasion below to deal with this well-known fact in detail and from various aspects. At the moment, however, we desire merely to show the glaring contradiction that exists between the demand for freedom of criticism and the specific features of our native criticism in Russian economism. It suffices but to glance at the text of the resolution in which the Union of Russian Social Democrats abroad endorsed the point of view of Rabochai Dilo. In the interests of the further ideological development of social democracy, we recognize the freedom of criticism of social democratic theory in party literature to be absolutely necessary insofar as the criticism does not run counter to the class and revolutionary character of this theory. And the motivation? The resolution in its first part coincides with the resolution of the Lubeck Party Congress on Bernstein. In the simplicity of their souls, the Unionists failed to observe what a testimonium paupertatis they betray with this copying. But, in its second part, it restricts freedom of criticism much more than did the Lubeck Party Congress. The resolution of the Union abroad, then, is directed against the Russian Bernsteinians? If it is not, then the reference to Lubeck would be utterly absurd. But it is not true to say that it restricts freedom of criticism. In adopting their Hanover Resolution, the Germans, point by point, rejected precisely the amendments proposed by Bernstein, while in their Lubeck Resolution, they cautioned Bernstein personally by naming him. Our free imitators, however, make not a single allusion to a single manifestation of specifically Russian criticism and Russian economism. In view of this omission, the bare reference to the class and revolutionary character of the theory leaves far wider scope for misinterpretation, particularly when the Union abroad refuses to identify so-called economism with opportunism. But all this in passing, the main thing to note is that the positions of the opportunists in relation to the revolutionary social democrats in Russia are diametrically opposed to those in Germany. In that country, as we know, the revolutionary social democrats are in favor of preserving that which exists. The old program and the tactics, which are universally known and have been elucidated in all their details by many decades of experience. But the critics desire to introduce changes, and since these critics represent an insignificant minority, and since they are very timid in their revisionist efforts, one can understand the motives of the majority in confining themselves to the dry rejection of innovations. In Russia, however, it is the critics and the economists who are in favor of preserving that which exists. The critics want us to go on regarding them as Marxist and to guarantee them the freedom of criticism they enjoyed to the full. The economists want the revolutionaries to recognize the sovereign character of the present movement, i.e. to recognize the legitimacy of that which exists. They want the ideologists not to try to divert the movement from the path that is determined by the interaction of material elements and material environment. They want to have that struggle recognized as desirable, which it is possible for the workers to wage under their present conditions, and as the only possible struggle which they are actually waging at the present time. We revolutionary social democrats, on the contrary, are dissatisfied with this worship of spontaneity, i.e., of that which exists at the present moment. We demand that the tactics that have prevailed in recent years be changed. We declare that, before we can unite, and in order that we may unite, we must first of all draw firm and definite lines of demarcation.
In a word, the Germans stand for that which exists and reject changes. We demand a change of that which exists and reject subservience thereto and reconciliation to it. This slight difference our free copyists of German resolutions fail to notice. D. Angles on the importance of the theoretical struggle. Dogmatism, doctrinarism, ossification of the party, the inevitable retribution that follows the violent straight lacing of thought. These are the enemies against which the knightly champions of freedom of criticism in Rabochai Dilo rise up in arms. We are very glad that this question has been placed on the order of the day, and we would only propose to add to it one other. And who are the judges? We have before us two publishers' announcements. One, the program of the periodical organ of the Union of Russian Social Democrats abroad, Rabochai Dilo. And the other, the announcement of the resumption of the publications of the Emancipation of Labor Group. Both are dated 1899, when the crisis of Marxism had long been under discussion. And what do we find? We would seek in vain in the first announcement for any reference to this phenomenon, or a definite statement of the position the new organ intends to adopt on this question. Not a word is said about theoretical work and the urgent tasks that now confront it, either in this program or in the supplements to it that were adopted by the Third Congress of the Union Abroad in 1901. During this time, the editorial board of Rabochai Dilo ignored theoretical questions in spite of the fact that these were questions that disturbed the minds of all social democrats the world over. The other announcement, on the contrary, points first of all to the declining interest in theory in recent years, imperatively demands vigilant attention to the theoretical aspect of the revolutionary movement of the proletariat, and calls for ruthless criticism of the Bernsteinian and other anti-revolutionary tendencies in our movement. The issues of Zarya, to date, show how this program has been carried out. Thus we see that high-sounding phrases against the ossification of thought, etc., conceal unconcern and helplessness with regard to the development of theoretical thought. The case of the Russian Social Democrats manifestly illustrates the general European phenomenon that the much-vaunted freedom of criticism does not imply substitution of one theory for another, but freedom from all integral and pondered theory. It implies eclecticism and lack of principle. Those who have the slightest acquaintance with the actual state of our movement cannot but see that the widespread of Marxism was accompanied by a certain lowering of the theoretical level. Quite a number of people with very little and even a total lack of theoretical training joined the movement because of its practical significance and its practical successes. We can judge from that how tactless Rabochai Dilo is when, with an air of triumph, it quotes Marx's statement, every step of real movement is more important than a dozen programs. To repeat these words in a period of theoretical disorder is like wishing mourners at a funeral many happy returns of the day. Moreover, these words of Marx are taken from his letter on the Gotha program, in which he sharply condemns eclecticism, in the formulation of principles. If you must unite, Marx wrote to the party leaders, then enter into agreements to satisfy the practical aims of the movement. But do not allow any bargaining over principles. Do not make theoretical concessions. This was Marx's idea, and yet there are people among us who seek, in his name, to belittle the significance of theory. Without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. This idea cannot be insisted upon too strongly at a time when the fashionable preaching of opportunism goes hand in hand with an infatuation for the narrowest forms of practical activity. 
Yet, for Russian Social Democrats, the importance of theory is enhanced by three other circumstances, which are often forgotten. First, by the fact that our party is only in process of formation. Its features are only just becoming defined, and it has as yet far from settled accounts with the other trends of revolutionary thought that threaten to divert the movement from the correct path. On the contrary, precisely the very recent past was marked by a revival of non-social democratic revolutionary trends. Under these circumstances, what at first sight appears to be an unimportant error may lead to most deplorable consequences, and only short-sighted people can consider factional disputes and a strict differentiation between shades of opinion inopportune or superfluous. The fact of Russian social democracy for very many years to come may depend on the strengthening of one or the other shade. Secondly, the social democratic movement is in its very essence an international movement. This means not only that we must combat national chauvinism, but that an incipient movement in a young country can be successful only if it makes use of the experiences of other countries. In order to make use of these experiences, it is not enough merely to be acquainted with them or simply to copy out the latest resolutions. What is required is the ability to treat these experiences critically and to test them independently. He who realizes how enormously the modern working class movement has grown and branched out will understand what a reserve of theoretical forces and political experience is required to carry out this task. Thirdly, the national tasks of Russian social democracy are such as have never confronted any other socialist party in the world. We shall have occasion further on to deal with the political and organizational duties which the task of emancipating the whole people from the yoke of autocracy imposes upon us. At this point, we wish to state only that the role of vanguard fighter can be fulfilled only by a party that is guided by the most advanced theory. To have a concrete understanding of what this means, let the reader recall such predecessors of Russian social democracy as Herzen, Belinsky, Chernyshevsky, and the brilliant galaxy of revolutionaries of the 70s. Let him ponder over the world significance which Russian literature is now acquiring. Let him, but be that enough. Let us quote what Engels said in 1874 concerning the significance of theory in the social democratic movement. Engels recognizes not two forms of the great struggle of social democracy, as is the fashion among us, but three, placing the theoretical struggle on a par with the first two. His recommendations to the German working class movement, which had become strong, practically and politically, are so instructive from the standpoint of present-day problems and controversies, that we hope the reader will not be vexed with us for quoting a long passage from his prefatory note to Der Deutsch Bauernkrieg, which has long become a great bibliographical rarity. The German workers have two important advantages over those of the rest of Europe. First, they belong to the most theoretical people of Europe, and they have retained that sense of theory which the so-called educated classes of Germany have almost completely lost. Without German philosophy, which preceded it, particularly that of Hegel, German scientific socialism, the only scientific socialism that has ever existed, would never have come into being. Without a sense of theory among the workers, this scientific socialism would never have entered their flesh and blood as much as is the case. What an immeasurable advantage this is may be seen, on the one hand, from the indifference towards all theory, which is one of the main reasons why the English working class movement crawls along so slowly in spite of the splendid organization of the individual unions. On the other hand, from the mischief and confusion wrought by prudentism in its original form among the French and Belgians and in the form further caricatured by Bakunin 
among the Spaniards and Italians. The second advantage is that chronologically speaking, the Germans were about the last to come into the workers' movement, just as German theoretical socialism will never forget that it rests on the shoulders of St. Simon, Fourier, and Owen, three men who, in spite of all their fantastic notions and all their utopianism, have their place among the most eminent thinkers of all times, and whose genius anticipated innumerable things, the correctness of which is now being scientifically proved by us. So the practical workers' movement in Germany ought never to forget that it has developed on the shoulders of the English and French movements, that it was able simply to utilize their dearly bought experience and could now avoid their mistakes, which in their time were mostly unavoidable. Without the precedent of the English trade unions and French workers' political struggles, without the gigantic impulse given especially by the Paris Commune, where would we be now? It must be said, to the credit of the German workers, that they have exploited the advantages of their situation with rare understanding. For the first time since the workers' movement has existed, the struggle is being conducted pursuant to its three sides. The theoretical, the political, and the practical economic. In harmony and in its interconnections, and in a systematic way. It is precisely in this, as it were, concentric attack, that the strength and invincibility of the German movement lies. Due to this advantageous situation, on the one hand, and to the insular peculiarities of the English and the forcible suppression of the French movement on the other, the German workers have for the movement been placed in the vanguard of the proletarian struggle. How long events will allow them to occupy this post of honor cannot be foretold. But let us hope that as long as they occupy it, they will fill it fittingly. This demands redoubled efforts in every field of struggle and agitation. In particular, it will be the duty of the leaders to gain an ever clearer insight into all theoretical questions, to free themselves more and more from the influence of traditional phrases inherited from the old world outlook, and constantly to keep in mind that socialism, since it has become a science, demands that it be pursued as a science, i.e. that it be studied. The task will be to spread an increased zeal among the masses of the workers, the ever more clarified understanding thus acquired, to knit together ever more firmly the organization both of the party and of the trade unions. If the German workers progress in this way, they will not be marching exactly at the head of the movement. It is not at all in the interest of this movement that the workers of any particular country should march at its head but they will occupy an honorable place in the battle line, and they will stand armed for battle when either unexpectedly grave trials or momentous events demand of them increased courage, increased determination, and energy. Engels' words prove prophetic. Within a few years, the German workers were subjected to unexpectedly grave trials in the form of the exceptional law against the socialists, and they met those trials armed for battle, and succeeded in emerging from them victorious. The Russian proletariat will have to undergo trials immeasurably graver. It will have to fight a monster compared with which an anti-socialist law in a constitutional country seems but a dwarf. History has now confronted us with an immediate task, which is the most revolutionary of all, the immediate tasks confronting the proletariat of any country. The fulfillment of this task, the destruction of the most powerful bulwark, not only of European, but of Asiatic reaction, would make the Russian proletariat the vanguard of the international revolutionary proletariat. And we have the right to count upon acquiring this honorable title, already earned by our predecessors, the revolutionaries of the 70s, if we succeed in inspiring our movement which is a thousand times broader and deeper, with the same devoted determination and vigor.